go over our prayer list and uh, update conditions. As always, we need to pray for those who are lost, for those who have backslid. Also, Brother Gene River hospitalized uh, Friday at Trinity West. He's in room 507. Call louder. Now, it's in, yeah, it's the, it's the midsection, the stomach area. So okay. they're at kind of pretty much at its all Okay. He has to have a test tomorrow and we'll know more about what's going on. Okay. Uh, Bill Crankovich for personal well being. Um, Bill gets home tomorrow. Today. Today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's getting home. Today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bailey battling cancer. Uh, Brother Ron continue treatments for his back. Uh, Joyce for healing, Joyce Caper for healing in her back. Uh, Brother Mark Langer. As you know, do I know the prayer chain? A lot of things happened with him last, last week, so uh, we'll be, uh, I'd like to uh, add a few things that we now think he has an onset of the phone line. Up to you, 
Father, we ask that you be with each and every one of these individuals, whether they be the spiritual hearing or the physical hearing. Father, we ask that you also be with their family members. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Communion here this morning with the broken cross. And, uh, as we prepare for that, thoughts to share. Jesus, what words come to mind when you hear that name? Perhaps Savior, friend, master, teacher, shepherd, man of God, maybe even sacrifice. Yes, our Savior Jesus is all of this and more. He came to this earth to save the lost, to lead his flock, to be the message of salvation, and to be a sacrifice for a world of sin. This time, we stop to remember Jesus' sacrifice for our sin, he is sharing around the table. Here we share in the cup, which is his blood, and the bread, his body. To honor Jesus for all he is to each of us, and to heed his command strive for heaven and spend eternity with him, our friend, our teacher, <coughs> our Savior, Jesus. Communion him is the old bread of the cross. <laughs>
the 25th Space Shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. My controller is here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously, a ranger will function. Taken aback, Lou said, Oh, 
And the man went on to tell Luke what a poor job he had done and how he should get a job going out something else. Luke asked him if he preached, and he said he didn't preach much, but he knew good preaching, and mine was not good. Lou then quoted an old mountain preacher friend of his and said, well, I like the way I can't preach better than the way you don't preach. Mm -hmm. A few months later, this man's wife left him because he was seeing another woman. Yes, his sins found him out, Lou said. And then in the next rendition, November 3rd through 8th, 1963, Central Church of Christ, Mount Vernon, Ohio, he writes about an exciting time as he drove from Tennessee to Ohio <coughs> to the Bible with his good friend and classmate Richard McBride, who many of you know, this would be your brother in law, but many of you already know that. Many of us know Richard. Richard was the minister there, an avid coon hunter, good preacher, outstanding personal walker, worker. And I knew we would have a good meeting, and we did. On the Lord's Day, we saw two baptized, one placed their membership. On Monday, as we went out for visitation, Dick said, did something I've never seen anyone ever do. He took the church's membership role with him. He said, we visited with many people on the hall who no longer attended. And as we went to the homes, we would simply ask them what their intentions were if they wanted to remain members. As I recall it, it made a few people angry, and they told Dick to remove their names. But to others, it was quite a shock to learn that they had quit. One man declared he had not quit. And Dick replied, well, you haven't been there in months. You don't give any support to the church or take part in any activities. What else would you have to do to quit? It was deathly quiet for a few moments. And the man said, well, I guess I have quit, haven't I? And he then promised to get back. And he did. I mean, if you know that a lot of folks on the church roll that think they're ready <clears throat> when they stand before God, it's going to be something like what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not perform any miracles? Lord, we were thinking of you when we did it all. Jesus said, I never knew you. Part from me. How many of you know that would be a fatal day, right? That would be a terrible fatality. Worse than the fatality of the space shuttle challenger. Worse than the terror of September 11, 2001. Worse than a tragic death or a premature death is the tragedy of someone standing before God thinking all is well, only to hear him say, Depart from me. And so I'd like to, with your permission today, look at a few scenarios in Scripture that I hope will help each one of us to avoid that type of fatality in our own lives and for the lives of those we love. I read on a church sign not too long ago, and then we used it on our church sign a couple weeks ago, this saying. How many of you remember the saying that said it is fatal? to enter into any battle without the will to win it. So what I'd like to do this morning with these four, whatever you want to call them, visuals <coughs> on, the, on the slide here, I would like to take that expression and substitute some words in that expression. The expression will be basically the same. The original expression was, it is fatal to any enter any battle without the will to win it. The new expression will be, it is fatal to enter any blank, so we're going to fill in the blank there, without the blank. Okay, we're going to, we're going to do that. Uh, this will make sense in just a moment. For instance, on the first one, you recognize the scene from Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, the only two inhabitants in the Garden of Eden, God has given one communion. You shall not be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when Satan comes into the picture in Genesis chapter 3, he gives these three words that are fatal to Eve. 
Has God said? Has God said? Has God said that you're not allowed to eat of any of the trees of the garden? And he said, Oh, we can eat of any of the trees of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we're not allowed to touch it, we're not allowed to eat it, but if we do, we'll die. Satan said, You won't die. God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you become wise as God. He took a look at the fruit, saw that it was good, she took it, she tasted it, gave her a husband, her eyes were open, she saw that it was naked, shame entered the human race, sin entered the human race, death entered the human race, all because of that. Some folks say, was it an apple on the ground that caused the problem? No, it was the pear on the ground. There was a problem. Adam and Eve. It is fatal to enter into any temptation without the will to seek God's counsel and obey Him. That's how we're taking that sign and re or that phrase and rephrasing it. It is fatal to enter any temptation without the will to seek God's counsel and obey him. Our premise is this, it was not that he did not know God's will. She knew God's will, she just wasn't willing to obey God. Number two, from 1 Samuel chapter 15, King Saul, given a command by God, destroy the Amalekites, Destroy all the animals. Get rid of it all. You may not understand the command at this time. I'm not here to explain God's command. God says, do it, you have to do it. You can look back and find out why God gave the command he did. God is always justified in giving the command to his judge. Just like we as parents try to teach our kids. Do what I say, right? Do what I say. Don't ask questions. Do what I say. And if time comes to explain later, then you can explain it right now and do it the same. Right? Do it the same. And so Saul is given the command to start the mountains. But he doesn't. He spares the king. He spares some of the choice animals. And when Samuel arrives on the scene, Samuel says, Why haven't you done what God asked to do? And Saul says, I have. I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. Samuel says, then why do I hear the bleeding in my ears? Why do I put all the animals here? What's going on? And in that chapter, we learn what Samuel said to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. Because Saul tried to explain his disobedience by saying, well, I've kept the best of the animals so that we can sacrifice them to God. And Samuel says, it's better to obey God than to offer a sacrifice. And here's my point on this, on that statement. It is fatal to enter into any endeavor without the will to submit to God's authority. Whatever we do, whatever the action, whatever the job, it's fatal to enter into any endeavor without the will to submit to the authority of God. How many of you ever question your parents' authority? It's okay to raise your hand. How many of you still are? Still things that my mother and father taught me that from time to time. My mom and dad have been dead for years, but there's still things that they've taught me over the years that I don't always submit. It's a thing about authority. And it was not because Saul didn't know what God's will was. He just wasn't willing to obey God. It's not that he didn't know what God told us. He just wasn't willing to obey God. Scenario number three, you see it there on the screen, 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is where Nathan is telling the story to David about how someone had sinned grievously against one of his fellow Israelites. And when David heard what this dude had done, David was so enraged, he said, that man ought to die. And Nathan points his finger at King David and says, you are the man. You're the man. And in 
that situation in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the Bible says it was springtime when the kings were to go out to battle and David stayed at home. King David, the one who slew the giant, remember that kid when he killed Goliath, the young boy, his heart was set on God. He wanted to serve God. Everything he did, he wanted to honor God all he did. How many you remember, remember those days in your early life as a Christian? I want to serve God. You know, I'm going to be as best I can be for him. And he becomes king of Israel. But then as the kings were going off the horse, David stayed home alone. No, I'm not talking about the movie Home Alone, but that's right on. Home Alone. In the evening he went out, he saw a woman bathing. His heart was filled with lust. He began to conceive in his mind a plan to get with that woman, and eventually he did. He had a relationship with her. Her name was Bathsheba. She conceived. And this is where David said, uh oh. He knew he was in trouble. He made a fatal mistake. Now he has one or two choices. He can either confess his sin and get right with God, or he can try another route. The route is defense, but he didn't choose that. Instead, he calls her husband home from battle, Uriah. Hey, how you doing? Has dinner with him, gets him drunk. And he says, let's go on down and have some fun with the missus. Yes. He looks out later that night and learns that Uriah has set up a cup outside the house and has not gone into the house at all. And so, long story short, since Uriah refused to compromise his integrity before God because he figured as long as the troops were battle, he wasn't going to enjoy the pleasures of marriage, he would stay true and he was anxious to get back to battle. David said, Fine, go back to battle. And he arranged, I believe it was with Joab. Arranged with the commander to put Uriah in the front line at the heat of battle and then to have all the troops withdraw from him. When you, when you read that, you're thinking, This is unbelievable. This is the, this is the one who fought the life of the Lord. This is the one who put his trust in God. This, this is the one who was a man after God's own heart. Here's the point it is fatal to enter into any day. Without the will to maintain your moral integrity. Who's the thought of what happened to David, right? He says, We have all the people. I've never thought of what happened to David. And Satan's back there doing his scheme. Of all the people, David probably thought, I would never do such a thing. But he did. Now I can give you good news on, on David's account because if you would like to read some time, the 51st chapter of the book of Psalms, we <coughs> will find that David found his way back. It was not until he was broken that God could put him back together again. David committed adultery. First, he looked with, with lust. That, that in itself is sin. Then he activated an actual act of adultery. And for all we know, continued in that action. And then when she was pregnant, he tried to cover it over with deceit and lies, and then ultimately murdered her husband. But he found his way back. The point is this, it's fatal to enter any day that we live without the will that we are maintaining our moral integrity, as 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35 would put it, to maintain an undistracted devotion to the Lord. Do you know what an undistracted devotion is? I don't mean to make light of this, but if any of you have a pet that always shows up at the table when you're eating, like we do, her name is Bandit. We love her. She's a great people. She's my second daughter. <laughs> we love her great. I'm telling you, when I have breakfast, she's there. And I give her a little piece of the egg my pop tart about four or five times a week. And she pop tarts, she gets about a tenth of a piece. I'm telling you, if I don't give it to her, she's right there. And her eyes are focused. And her head doesn't move. 
and she's either looking at the pop tart or she's looking at something like that. And then she's looking at the pop tart. And then when I take that pop tart, and sometimes the teeth of God's dream of that, I'll raise it in her eyes and slowly follow that thing all the way. She, when it comes to food, has an undistracted focus, undistracted ability. Unless we have the intense, undistracted focus that we will maintain our moral integrity for this day. Don't worry about tomorrow, right? Forget about yesterday. Just worry about today. Just worry about today. It's not because David didn't know God's will. He just wasn't willing to obey God. Then do you remember in John chapter 8, the woman taking the donkey? It is fatal to enter into any promise with God or without man, without the will to sever our times from sinful passion, sinful behavior, sinful attitude. It is fatal. To enter into any promise or covenant. If you're married, you've entered into a covenant. If you're a Christian, you've entered into a covenant with God. It is fatal to enter into that partnership, that promise, that covenant, without the will to cut off all ties from any sinful behavior, any sinful passion, any sinful attitude. And when you do break off from the sin, it is also fatal if you do not accept the fact that you are forgiven. Amen? My, how we struggle with this. Speaking with a dear saint on the phone this past week, who spoke of her husband who battling cancer, said, when things and if things get bad, if it looks like we're going to lose them, if you'd like to see us, if you'd like for me to come down, I'd love to see him again. She said, we already requested that, if you would like to see it. And I said, well, she said, he's not afraid to die. She said, he basically told the family, going through all this chemo and all this, I just really... You guys, some of you might be doing good with chemo, but if you're on it, he's not. He, he's sicker at all. It's terrible. He says it's torture. He says, I don't know why it made me go through it. It's torture. Obviously, we don't want to lose him. We'd like to have him with us a bit longer. But he told his wife, he says, I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. So here is a man that has severed his time with sinful behavior. He still, even as sick as he is, reads God's word every day for an hour or more. He rises in the morning as the first thing he does. Folks, you can enter into covenant with God. You can forsake all those sinful things in your life. But if you don't accept the fact that you are forgiven, it's just as fatal as never giving up the sin in the first place. Because of the smoke of our hope in heaven. And we're going to be together in heaven again one day. She said, I hope so. Now, unless she has sin in her life, of which I don't know, what I think her struggle is this. Her struggle is believing that God would actually forgive her. Whatever it is she's done in her life. I don't mean to speak for her, but does, does that relate to anyone in my audience today? In John chapter 8, here's the woman taken in adultery, and they drug her before Christ. He said, Moses Law said we should stone such a woman. What do you do today? And I like Jesus' approach. He just kind of did this. And somebody that just looked up said, Where are you going? Jesus knelt down. Wrote in the same. 
and it says, He that has no sin among you, let him be the first to cast the stone. And he stood all of them were wrong. Just he and a woman. Remember that? He said, Woman, I'm one of those. Are there none left to condemn you? And what did she say? Someone's right. What did he say? Neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. But here's the question for you today. It's a hundred dollar question. If Christ does not condemn us, then who are we to condemn ourselves? And who are we to condemn others who have been acquitted of all their sins? Well, you, you just don't understand, Brother Pete. You don't understand what I've done. <coughs> You're right. I probably don't understand what you've done. I don't always understand what I've done. But I do understand what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 says. Even though it's uh, I'm not saying that to be smart. I'm not saying it to, to offend you this morning. I was reading a sermon by Ed Bowsman the other day. He did the New Testament inside and out. He was always embarrassed if anybody would ask him a question where does the Bible say this? And he wasn't able to tell him right where it was. He felt embarrassed. I don't always feel embarrassed, but I can't turn around and let me ask him a question. But sometimes I have to say, I'm not sure where that is. And it frustrates me, right? But this is one passage that you can say, hey, first Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. I've been there enough times. I know it's there. It's like those numbers on 316, what it says. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. I might not understand what you've done. That's not important. What's important is that you and I understand first Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. When Paul said, Don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Need your fornicators. Well, those are folks that have sexual relationships outside of marriage. Nor idolaters. Nor driver worshippers. When you place anything before your God, it is more important to you than God and your brothers and sisters in Christ. <coughs> Nor adulterers. Those are married individuals who are unfaithful to the wedding vows. It's, it's more than just having sexual relationships outside of marriage. You break any part of your marriage covenant. You don't have to have sexual affairs outside of marriage. You just have adultery. You break your covenant you gave when you were married. Nor the effeminate, nor the church, what the Bible would refer to as those who are perverted. Some sexual things. Kids, if you're on Facebook, please be careful on Facebook. It's a dangerous way. If you get into those things, you've got to tell you that this morning. There's some perverted things on there. Parents, grandparents, get involved. Don't wait a day. Don't, don't wait another day. I want to see your Facebook page. I want to see it now. Just scroll down and see what they're doing. You've got to stop. You're homosexual. Not here to the Nor thieves. Now, what's a thief? Someone that takes what's not here. You don't have to keep your money. <coughs> Covetous. They won't hear to give God. Drunkards won't. Revilers won't. I don't know. Reviler is someone who <coughs> hates authority and is arrogant against those who are in authority. Swindlers won't. Some of the other kind of swindling. You know, you're talking about that car you can't go over today, brother. You know, good thing we don't make the name of the car. You know, you can do that all day, too. Thanks to those sins, we found out. Paul says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That means these individuals who continue to insist. On having it their way, even though they know the will of God, they just don't want to obey God. God says heaven is not for them. 
And I'm glad that Paul oh, doesn't stop there. Look what he says next in verse 11. Such were some of you. You were washed, though. When were you washed, folks? When you were buried with Christ in baptism, the Bible says you were washed. Saul, Tarsus, Ananias said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. There's other scriptures that list other sins beside these. He was a murderer. He was a blasphemer. But Saul's sin were washed away. And when he accepted that God had forgiven him, he led a mighty life with Jesus Christ. And he's the one that wrote these words through the inspiration of the scripture. And he said, you were washed, you were sanctified, and he cleansed, and you were justified. Justified, that's a term of acquittal. That's when the judge looks at you and says, all charges have been what? Dropped. You're free to go. Sin no more. Don't do it again. Why? Because you're going to be back right back in court. Paul says, such was some of you. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Jesus Christ is the ultimate Savior and is fatal. To enter into any day, any endeavor, any action, any whatever, without the will to totally abandon ourselves to Him. And then when we do, and we've obeyed God, even in baptism and beyond, then to also acknowledge and accept, I am forgiven. I have been forgiven. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, we are told some amazing things about the forgiveness that you and I have received. Say, brother, but, but, but brother D, you don't understand what I've done. How long do I have to say it? Because this is going to come back. This is going to come back again someday. You're going to say, you don't understand what I've done. God could never forgive me. First John 1 5, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, he has walked in darkness, we do not. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, what? Anybody read it with me? Cleanses. <coughs> Underline that word. His blood cleanses us from how much of the sin? All. Now, to say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to those who have already been baptized in this book. So they can don't get all hung up because he doesn't mention baptism. The preacher didn't say he mentioned baptism. I'm speaking to the Christians now because if you're not a Christian this morning, we hope you decide before you leave today, especially before you leave this life, to be a Christian and serve God with all your mind. That's your decision. We certainly hope it for you. <clears throat> but if you do become a Christian, understand this you will still have issues with sin. And so if you don't believe that, could I ask those who are already Christians, how many of you have sinned since you were baptized? Yeah. Maybe the same day you were baptized. And so if that happened, here's what you do. How do I know that I know God? How, how do I avoid that uh-oh moment? First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to what? Forgive us our sins and uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He himself is the propitiation, he's the payment. In other words, for our sins. Not for ours only, 
but also for those of the whole world. But Brother Dean, you don't understand what I've done. Oh, audience, I don't understand what most all the church has done throughout the whole world. I don't understand why we're not devoted like we ought to be. I don't understand why I'm not devoted like I ought to be. But I do understand this, that when I confessed it to God, and when I was baptized into Christ, he took my sin as far as the east is from the west, and it's gone. I'm forgiven. How about you? But as we know, we come to know him to keep his commandments. Verse 3. As we close out our time together today, this is a, a time for reflection and invitation. <coughs> if you're not a Christian today, Chances are good you know I'm not here to hound you. I'm here to provide the direction through God's word for you. If you want to know God, if it's your desire, let me ask you, is it your desire to know Him? Do you want to go to heaven? You know, is that your desire? Do you want to belong to him? Do you want your name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Verse, if, if you haven't heard, I'm convinced you have heard, but here it is. Here it is, verse 3 of chapter 2. Here's how you can know. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says that I've come to know him does not keep his commandments. He's a liar. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God is truly and perfected. By this we know that we're in him. The one who says he abides in him on himself to walk in the same manner as I still remember 26 years ago teaching the math class. Principal walking in. He said we lost the count. But I didn't know until years later that the final word was not love. But I want to talk to you before you decide to follow up, before you decide to go to the next dimension of God finally calling him on to one day, one day that valley of the shadow of death will call our name. So we're going to be fighting the battle of the earth. Before you launch into eternity, it is fatal. It is fatal to enter into eternity without the will and desire to know that you know that you know God. It's fatal. I don't want anyone here in the audience today to be under one of those before Almighty God. I'd rather us be able to do like Thomas, oh my Lord, my God, all for our needs. And for Christ to say to the Father, and to announce your name. I've already told those that he's going out medically. And he says, Harry Albert, before he gets to Dean Black, Harry Albert was my original name when I was born. And then when I was adopted, he became Dean Black. I'm telling you, okay, if you know Harry Albert, I'm jumping up just in case. That's okay, Dean, we got you covered. There wasn't another Harry Albert. Isn't that going to be great, though, to, to anticipate? Are you anticipating it today? Are you hearing it? And calling your name. <clears throat> Take somebody to talk for us. <coughs> God in his presence. You love them this morning. Call them up. It's your vision. You're still struggling with that. Pray as we sing this song. Pray that my heart is changed. Maybe it's not that we don't know the will of God. Maybe it's, it's my death to lead to day God. <coughs> Let's do it, shall we? Let's obey God. For his glory, shall we? For our benefit, the benefit of those that we need. <laughs> Amen.
go up and join this chair. And then Philip got run up. He heard me reading Isaiah, the prophet, and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, Well, I'll try, unless someone guides me. He invited Philip to come up and sit with me. I passed the church which he was reading this. It was that as the sheep to slaughter, with the lamb before the shearer and the sodom, so he had not opened his mouth. And he knew no ratio to the judgment to give him away. Who shall relate his translation? For his life was removed from the earth. And the reader answered, Philip and said, Please tell me, who does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth to begin, but this scripture would preach Jesus to him. And as he went along the road, he came to some water. And he said, Look, water. What would this be when they were baptized? Philip said, If you believe in the Lord of God, he said, and the answer said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. <coughs> and he ordered the chariot to start and the foot went down to the water. Philip was drawn to me, and he baptized him. And he gave him my eyes of the water. The spirit of the Lord snatched him Philip away. And the reader saw him no more, but my own heart rejoiced. And Philip found himself a pastor. Preaching the gospel to all the cities where the man is located. We have to hear the news of the day. We call it Christ and the cities.
truly a dream. I know that things are pretty tough right now, but uh, we're getting to our, with your help. I know the angels are jumping and rejoicing and sending some to place their life in your hands. My prayer is that we will learn to do that more often. That we need to turn to you. Now, there's all kinds of stuff we think we have to have, like money and all that our faith in that, we got to learn that you are the true and almighty king, and that we need to put our faith in you. Let us go our separate ways, glorifying you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
we can get some autographs. <laughs> uh, I would sure be glad to do that. Oh, hey, uh, Goldie, Arthur, so Denise is the distribution center. So she might have, you know, what she's going to work in. Um, and I'll have the calendar all marked up for her for next okay, Sunday. Okay, well, next Sunday I'll have a calendar wrote out. Okay, because... Hey, hey, can we please talk to that? Yeah, because there's none on this one, honey. All right. It, She's going to call me Wednesday. Huh? 